Welcome, everything is great. You are listening to Forking Bullshit, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. I'm Jason. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 2, Episode 8, Derek. It was written by Cord Jefferson, directed by Jude Wang, and it aired November 2nd, 2017. We begin directly after last week's episode with Janet explaining Derek's existence to Michael. He's worried that Derek's presence will be catastrophic to their plan. Michael sends Jason and Tahani on a couple's camping trip to get rid of them, and Chidi nearly catches Eleanor watching the secret VHS tape. And they're interrupted by Michael, who comes seeking ethical advice. Okay, I really love this first scene with Janet and Michael and Derek, because Janet seems like Michael's rebellious daughter. She's like, well, it's our void now, and we moved in together, and I know it's quick, but we know everything, Mm -hmm. you know? Just that, like... 19 year old girl who's like just met a guy but is moving way too quickly that's what it seems like you don't understand me dad we're in love exactly we're meant to be together Mm -hmm. so on that note janet immediately defies michael right michael says you have to get rid of him and janet says no is that scary at all She's going directly against her main objective she's going rogue she went off the tracks immediately like no right Huh, I didn't notice that, but that's a good point. She's not she's not following under his, orders. Yeah, she's not under his command anymore. Yeah. Wow. That's potentially terrifying. Oh, it could be. She has all the power in the universe. And she's not listening to Michael. Yes, her boss. Yeah. Wow. Well, it could be interesting to see if she would do some bad stuff, but I think Janet is essentially good. Right. So she won't do anything... She's not going to be abusing her power. No, I don't think so. But I think this will definitely come up in the next half of season two. I think so, too. I don't think that Derek was just kind of a runaway joke of Janet needing a rebound guy. I think it's really going to be very important for her character that Mm -hmm. she can create people and that she seems to have her own will now. Right. Yeah. I like the detail that Derek has a last name. Like, why would you give him a last name? He's not a person on Earth. He doesn't need to, like, pay taxes and have files on him. But (laughs) she names him Derek Hostetler. Like, there's no reason for that. (laughs) And then later he introduces himself as Derek Hostetler Mm P.I. And I was like, hmm, is that like a Veronica Mars reference? Maybe, maybe just like a subtle one. So I think it's actually a Magnum P.I. reference. Because on Magnum P.I., there's a character named Francis Hofstetler. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. It could be be that. I thought, I looked it up and I'm like, that could be just a little Easter egg. Somebody was a big Ice Pick fan. Yeah, that makes sense. That was his nickname. Okay. I still choose to believe it's Veronica Mars. Okay, no problem. Yeah, okay. We'll give you that one. You're most likely right (laughs) on that. That's fun, because maybe Janet was just like, she really liked Magnum P.I.? Okay, I always want to say, like, Miami P.I. <laughs> You're mixing Miami Vice and I know. Miami P.I. I definitely am. Janet's little disappointed noise after Derek doesn't say sentences when she's like, we finish each other's Derek! And her just her sound, the sound she makes is, like, my new favorite thing. I really want it to be, like, my text notification sound. <laughs> That'd be great. Because she's just sort of like a, oh, <laughs> Oh, it's too good. Darcy Carton is fantastic in this episode. She really gets to flex those acting muscles Mm -hmm. because she's always just been Janet. And Janet has been evolving. But this episode, we get to see her go through so many different emotions that it's really fun to watch. She shines. Mm -hmm. So then we see Jason and Tahani and they're watching Home Alone. My favorite holiday movie. Yeah, we're going to be watching it soon. Very soon. As soon as December (laughs) hits and I get some free time, put on Home Alone. Oh, yeah. Put on the calc. Yeah, the Home Alone joke is fantastic. I love it. I love that Tahani would look at it that way because, of course, she would. Mm -hmm. She can't just, like, sit there and have fun. Oh, Tahani. She probably sympathizes with Kevin McAllister's character because he comes from a rich family. Oh, yes. She knows that life. Yeah. Except I'm pretty sure the McAllisters don't rank anywhere near the Algemills. No, <laughs> no. The guy who can afford to bid five million pounds for a lunch with his own daughter? Yeah, maybe maybe not that close of a 
camaraderie there. Yeah, she's probably like, oh, isn't this so quaint? This <laughs> tiny home. <laughs> this poor family. Yeah. I really like Jason and Tahani this episode. I do and I don't. Mm -hmm. There are parts that I really like them and there are parts that I just don't get it. You want to go into that a bit later? Yeah. And then, of course, we see Eleanor with the VHS and it seems to be canon that every time we don't see Eleanor, she's watching it. Yeah. Since Chidi says, well, you watch that movie a lot. She says it's my new favorite movie, right? It's yeah. basically my favorite movie. Michael unveils Derek to Eleanor and Chidi. He wants to kill Derek. But Chidi insists they cannot, nor can they break up Jason and Tahani to save themselves. Jason and Tahani enjoy their time together while tensions rise between Janet and Derek. Okay, so this is the part where I do like Jason and Tahani. It's fun to see Tahani let go a little bit, but their dynamic is kind of boring already, I think. Because she's, you know, she's the smart, upper class woman, and he's just an idiot, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know how much you can do with that. Right. Or how much the writers really are doing with that. You don't see this as an opportunity for Tahani to learn more about life through Jason. And that's a lesson that she can continuously learn. There's just something about it, I think. <laughs> you just don't like them as a couple. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think they're fun. I think it, Jason really brings out the carefree personality that is hiding in Tahani that she wants to get out. Mm. But she even says later on in the episode that she's never had a friend that she can be herself around. And that made me think that she doesn't even know who she is because she's never able to be herself. Right. So she's always is... just being Tahani Aljamil, the award-winning legs lady. Exactly. Right. So she might not even know who she is. And mm. being with Jason can bring enlightenment. He's going to do his monkly duties without even realizing it. Hmm. Okay. He is really sweet in this moment, just trying to get her to have some fun and to relax a little bit. Like, look, it, croquet is fun, but... But wouldn't it be better to just, like, whack the ball really hard? Yeah, and then also is fun. break stuff? Breaking <laughs> stuff could be cool, too. Yeah. Like, she does seem to be having fun, but it feels like she's not comfortable doing it either. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think she is comfortable doing it, but it's because it's going against everything she's ever learned mm -hmm. and has been taught. No, you make a very good point. I think really what I dislike at this point is that we're separating Jason and Tawny so much from Eleanor and Chidi and Michael that Team Cockroach doesn't really feel like a team right now. Yes. They feel like separate stories, and that's just not that fun. I like the group all together. As I know that you do as well. Yes. And I just want to see more than little jokes about how Jason's a swamp dweller who's a total idiot and Tahani is amazing and award winning for all these things, right? Like, mm -hmm. as funny as those jokes can be, they start to get stale after right. a while. Agreed. So I hope we continue to see Tahani learning to relax and be true to herself, whatever that happens to be. With the rest of the group. Yes. Yes. Definitely. I think she needs to spend more time with friends too. Not just being her and Jason all the time. Because mm -hmm. I know when you start a relationship at first, there's that honeymoon period where you spend way too much time together. So I'm hoping by the second half of season two, they've kind of gotten out of that. Everybody knows about them now. Yeah. And they can just kind of relax a little bit more. Right. Agreed. Yeah. So back to Michael and Eleanor and Chidi. Michael's got this really great smile when Eleanor says he's a mess messy bench who loves drama. And it's just really cute. I love that little moment of camaraderie between the two of them. Yeah, they bonded a little bit more this episode. They're still, like, not great people. Yeah, we're not trying to skirt around that fact. Like, mm -hmm. Eleanor's still kind of terrible. Oh, yeah. And she's definitely the most like Michael here. Mm -hmm. Now, she's changed a lot from first season. Yeah. Eleanor, by the end of first season, is miles ahead of this Eleanor, in my opinion. You think? I think her growth in season one is more apparent, obviously, because it's been months and months and months. I think it was three months. I believe the first season was three months. And I still feel like season one Eleanor has grown a lot more than season two Eleanor. Okay. In what ways? She is less awful in season one. 
So you think she's more awful this season? Yes, I can still see her earthbound life personality coming through. Oh. More and more. With the the comments about loving drama, that kind of thing? I I don't know. It's just little comments here and there, uh, reminiscing fondly about her past a bit too much. Okay. I just feel like she hasn't grown as much, but because we haven't given her enough time. Mm, Okay. You don't agree? No, not really. And not in this episode when she does something so important for Jana at the end. Mm -hmm. So Chidi here says that it's okay to keep a secret as long as that secret isn't harming anyone and telling a person that secret would cause them harm. I thought that was a little odd. I don't agree with them. Oh, okay. Most of the time. Most of the time. Can you give me a scenario where you don't agree with him? I'm having trouble distinguishing the difference between a secret and a lie. Hmm. Okay, so... How about I give you a couple different scenarios? Okay. So imagine that you have had sexual fantasies about someone you work with. Okay. Okay. And you think they're attractive, but it's causing them no harm that you've had that attraction to them. Like, it doesn't matter because you're not making it obvious at work. Mm -hmm. And if you told them that secret, it might make them feel very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So would keeping that secret be okay? Yes. Okay. Another example that I assume you're going to agree with me about is if you know that someone's significant other is cheating on them. So is it okay to keep that secret? No. Even though it's none of my business, it the well-being of my friend is my business. Yeah, of course. If you see your friend's significant other out on a date with someone else, smooching and the whole biz, and you know they're not in an open relationship... Mm-hmm. Would you want to tell them? Absolutely, because save you'd them want from future harm, right? Same difference. Like you'd want that person to tell you if the roles were reversed. Yeah, I believe there are going to be situations where Chidi's rules do not apply. There's always going to be that exception. Yeah, Chidi's rules are always going to be fairly morally strict as well. So we have to understand that sometimes in the real world, those rules are flexible, right? Because he says here, as long as the secret isn't harming anyone, now someone cheating on their significant other is harming them. But telling the person that secret is going to cause them harm. Like, it will make them sad or upset. So, let's go back to Chidi's past on Earth with those red boots that his friend has. Now, that's a lie. That's not a secret. Hold on, hold on. Let's let's back it up for a second. Okay, okay. So, let's modify the situation slightly. Chidi's friend has these ridiculous boots. Mm -hmm. Everybody's making fun of him for them. Chidi doesn't say anything, despite him knowing that everyone's making fun of him. Would it be right for him to mention to his friend that your boots are a little bit extreme and people are making fun of you? Telling him would cause his friend to be sad. Maybe a little ashamed, maybe maybe a little embarrassed. Okay. But keeping the secret continues on everybody making fun of him. I think there is a different way of confronting that problem by confronting the people who are making fun of your friend and just saying, yeah, you know, he's got a bit of a different style, but he likes the boots, so let's not be total jerks about it. But if the friend finds out that everybody was making fun of him and GD knew about it, I'd be a little bit frustrated with GD. Like, hey, why didn't you say anything? I didn't realize that people were ragging on me for my sweet boots. My sweet boots. <laughs> yeah, my sweet red my red rocket boots. I don't know. In that situation, I'd rather my friend tell me that my style, my choice of style was not the most acceptable. Okay. I guess I would want my friend to defend me. Not if it moment. looks like crap. Yeah, well, that wouldn't bother me that much, hmm. I suppose. I've already been made fun of for my style before. Like when I was in high school and I went through my goth-ish phase briefly people made fun of me but i didn't care because i liked what i was wearing at the Mm -hmm. time so it didn't really matter that much and i think that chidi's friend felt the same like he liked the boots he i don't think he really cared what people thought i think he did well he cared what chidi thought because chidi was like a close friend Mm -hmm. but he probably wouldn't care what his students think while he wears the red boots talking about he, the apocalypse. See, I think he was completely oblivious. He thought he was he had the most stylish shoes ever and everybody was in awe, but they mm. were just not. Mm. So, like I said before, I think there's going to be exceptions. And I yeah. think it all depends on context. 
just like most of these rules of ethics. Mm -hmm. So just to expand on that a little bit, I did do some research. Chidi is often quoting Immanuel Kant, and we know already that Kant believed that lying was intentionally deceiving someone and one should not deceive others. So he believed you should never lie. But keeping a secret does not necessarily equal deception, as we mentioned. Right. So everybody keeps secrets about themselves. Like, I don't tell everyone I met exactly how I feel about them. And that's not deception, because no one expects anyone to share every thought that they have, and people would likely be pretty appalled if you did. You know, if you went up to the cashier at Walmart and you just started saying everything you think about them, even if they're very negative things. Or even things like, I forgot to brush my teeth this morning. Yeah, just maybe don't say every thought that comes through your head, right? No one does that, and people would think it was super weird. Mm -hmm. But secret keeping isn't a widely discussed topic in ethics, so I guess I'll take Chidi's word on this one. So do you think that in this particular case, the secret that Eleanor knows, do you think that it is okay for her to keep that secret? Yes. Really? I mean, it's not doing any f any harm, but I believe it might be influencing Eleanor and the way she acts around Chidi. And I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a tough one. But I still think that Chidi is right in the situation that it's not hurting Chidi by her not telling him. Mm -hmm. But if he found out that she knew, then that might be even worse. Yeah. I think it's a good thing that Eleanor is the one to show him. Oh, absolutely. And not him finding out through Mindy or him accidentally finding out by putting in Cannonball Run because he's like, wonder what this movie's about, mm -hmm. you know? It's better that she tells him. I still think it's not okay to keep this secret because it is affecting, like you said, affecting her relationship with Chidi because she's acting evasive and uncomfortable around him. Well, she's and... got the higher ground. She has one up on him mm -hmm. because she knows something that he doesn't about them. Yeah, and that's... that's just weird. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, the odds are not even or the, the scales are not even for them. Yeah, and I don't think that telling him actually would cause him that much harm. I think it would be a little uncomfortable because of the way he feels now, but it's something that they can relate to together, right? Like, mm -hmm. Neither of us remember this moment. We were both wiped. We both said I love you. It's not like we were on uneven footing in this tape. Right, exactly. So maybe dealing with that together would be better than dealing with it alone. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And there's another really great line from Chidi here that I think is so relevant. I love how he says, I know it's tempting to take a shortcut, but moral strength is defined by how we behave in times of stress. Mm -hmm. Man, the show. Ugh. Oh. Very good. You never know what type of person you are until you're put in a situation where you've never been in. Mm -hmm. And how you react defines who you are. Exactly. When we think about morality and moral strength to that extent, well, that's how we act, right? So how are you going to act when you're put in a stressful situation? And this is exactly what's going on in this episode. Michael is put in a stressful situation. He's reminding him like, hey, you know, this is the moment. This is where you're going to figure out what kind of person you are. So take a moment, breathe, think this through. Don't just act on instinct because uh, often our instincts are not going to align with what is best morally. Mm -hmm. Fight or flight. Well, our instincts are usually to protect ourselves through any means necessary. And sometimes those can be not morally permissible at all, like killing yeah. someone or harming someone. Shoving someone under the bus. Yep. Exactly. So as much under as this, a bigger bus. Yeah. <laughs> so as much as this episode is about Derek, yeah, it's very much about Michael. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot to say about Michael. I think by the end of this episode, I've got I've got some stuff to say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Shall we continue? Jason proposes to Tahani, and after a moment's pause, she accepts. An emotional Janet delivers a wedding invitation to the others who are still dealing with a frequently disappearing Derek. Wow. Tahani says yes. She says okay. Yeah. She makes a really good point when she says, why would I marry you? Like, what is the point? Because we discussed this, I think, last season when Jason proposed to Janet. Like, what does marriage even mean in the afterlife? In that case, it was a little bit different because it's Janet, 
right? And there's no possibility that she is your soulmate. Right. Because she, at that time, was not considered a person. So, I, I still think this is crazy, though. Like, why? What's the point in getting married? Right? Jason just digs to Hani. He's like, what's the next step? I, I think this girl's hot. I think I love her. Let's get married. Why not? That's the next step. Yeah, Jason also takes marriage, obviously, very lightly because right. he seems to jump into it pretty quickly. Sure. He's like the Ross of this show, you know, just marrying everyone that he kind of likes. <laughs> <sighs> so we'll see if he ends up getting the triple, like if he married, tries to marry somebody else on Eleanor. the show. Because, I mean, Ross married three people. So maybe Cheaty. Next iteration, he'll fall in love with Cheaty. Who knows? Sure. Chidi's the hot teacher, you know? I don't think changing, having resets will change somebody's sexuality. Yeah, probably not. (laughs) I'm just saying, we don't know. We don't know. Nope. Okay. Yeah, it is a little crazy to me that Tahani says yes, because it seems like she wouldn't. I think she's in the zone. Like, she's riding the high that she's on. She's having fun. She's carefree right now. She's, She's high on Jason. Okay. His spirit just being so fun and energetic and loose. And I think she's like, you know what? I don't want to overthink this. Why should I overthink this? He's making very good points. He loves me. He's going to be great to me always. Let's do it. She's not really thinking long term. Yeah, I think the idea that marriage doesn't really mean that much in the afterlife is probably what gets her to agree. Mm -hmm. Because she's not thinking about, oh, well, till death do us part. It's just Yeah, this is sort of just the next step, I suppose. And I never got married on Earth, so why not have fun and get to plan a wedding and wear a wedding dress? Like, Yeah, I can plan a new party. This is going to be so much fun. Yeah, exactly. Although, it is a little weird. Like, Tahani doesn't go super all out for this wedding. Like, they've got a few chairs, I think. And they've got a runner, and she's got a dress that's nice, but nothing so interesting i suppose i was expecting something like really haute couture you know super elaborate with a train that's like 10 miles long yeah 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 something like that but you know we did it quick whatever maybe janet wasn't really feeling that she wasn't going all vera wang on her Mm -hmm. so yeah be kind of funny if i ended up finding out that the dress itself was actually a vera wang original (laughs) i don't know what kind of dress it is but uh tweet us You know, send us an email. Let us know if you know the make of the dress. We learned a little bit about their schooling. Yeah. The Hertfordshire Academy for Expressionless Girls. Perfect. Beautiful. And of course, the Sarbonne. Mm Mm-hmm. Which I learned about, which was kind of fun. I don't know much about it, so tell us. Uh, Colloquially known as the University of Paris, Mm. the second oldest university in Europe, which started around 1150. Oh my god. That's like... A long time ago. (laughs) That's like, that's so long ago. I know, right? And it was actually finally recognized in 1215 by Pope Innocent III. There was a Pope named Innocent? Yes, That sounds like a rap name. I'm sorry. You know? (laughs) His real (laughs) name, his real name was, his real name was Lotario del Conti de Segni. Oh my gosh, that Mm. is a mouthful. That's Italian for you. Yeah. And, of course, Jason going to Leonard Skinner High School, which doesn't actually exist. No, of course not. <laughs> but, but I love it. It's great. Yeah, it is great. Um, Just a bunch of tugboats in a in a junkyard. I know. I, I feel like, I don't know, maybe Jason actually went to the actual school that the Leonard Skinner band went to, and then he just forgot, and then he thought he was in school, but he was just... I think like, it's better that it's just like... A school that wasn't even registered as a school. Oh, yeah. Okay. I like that. But he grew up living in like a trailer park, probably. <laughs> and his parents just sent him there because they didn't know any better. Now, if you're not familiar with Leonard Skinner, um, they were super popular in the early 70s. Three of their main members, including the lead singer, died in a plane crash in 1977. Oh, ouch. Yeah. They're most well known for Sweet Home Alabama. Oh, yeah. Okay. And Free Bird. Um, oh my gosh, Free Bird. Yep. <laughs> Anybody who's ever played like Guitar Hero. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of. And they're from Jacksonville, Florida, of course. Oh, that's good. I'd be honored to go to that school. Why not? Yeah, pretty cool. 
We do hear some kind of appalling stuff about Jason's life in this episode. That he talks about like so normally, like so casually. Yeah. And I wonder a little bit about his home life. Like, did he actually grow up like living in a trailer park? I mean, we can pretty safely assume that he didn't have a very fancy lifestyle and that his parents were probably not the smartest people Mm -hmm. or the most well-educated, I should say. Right. Yeah. So we've seen Eleanor's home life when she Mm -hmm. was a kid. Yeah. We've seen Tahani's home life as a child. We have not seen Chidi's. We have not seen Chidi's. And we have not seen Jason. Right. So maybe we're going to get to see theirs. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering if we'll get some more flashbacks because... They've been very sparse this season. Yeah. And I do kind of miss them a little bit. Like, just giving us some insight and seeing spots in their lives that we haven't seen. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily using them for just, hey, here's a joke about how awful Eleanor was. But actually getting to see maybe why they grew up the way that they did. Why they became the people that they were. Right. Yeah. I really do like that Janet is having difficulty concealing her emotions now. When she's handing out the invitations, she looks pissed. She looks really sad to me. Yeah. The wedding invitation is great, too. Of course. It's very fun to see Ted dance and say biznatches. (laughs) I'm sure he enjoyed that. I'm sure everybody on set really enjoyed that, and they had to film it a few times just so no one would laugh. So this is where we get introduced to the doctrine of double effect. You mean the loophole of double effect? No. Uh Uh-huh. You think it's a loophole? It's a huge loophole. Okay. It's like created by the ethics masters to be able to do what they want without feeling crummy. So let's learn a little bit more about the doctrine of double effect. Yes. It was (laughs) first introduced by Thomas Aquinas who stated that sometimes it is permissible to cause a harm as a side effect of bringing about a good result, even though it would not be permissible to cause such a harm as a means to bringing about the same good end. You're allowed to do a bad thing as long as you don't really mean to do a bad thing. That's basically what it is. No, it's not. And that's the problem is because most people would interpret it that way, but Mm -hmm. that's not how it is. Okay. Okay. So consider the doctrine of double effect on the permissibility of self-defense. Killing an assailant to save your own life is permissible as it only has two effects. Mm -hmm. One, saving your life, which is the intended consequence, and two, killing your assailant, which, which is besides the intention. That's not what you mean to do. Right. Your only goal is to save your own life, and if you kill your assailant in doing so, it is permissible, but only if you do not use excessive force. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, Aquinas argued that if a person uses more than the necessary force to defend themselves, then the act is unlawful. Like saying, it was self-defense, your honor, but you stabbed him 37 times. Exactly. Well, it was still self-defense. Yeah, versus... You should have stopped after the first time. Versus, you know, uh, he's running after you with a knife, you're going up the stairs, you push him, he falls down the stairs, and dies. Right. That's not unnecessary force you're trying to get the person away from you your intention is to save your life your intention is not hey i really want this guy to die it's just i really want this guy to not chase me with a knife or i really want this guy to die how do i make it look like it was self-defense see that's not permissible (laughs) right because that's what michael tries to do yes exactly wink wink that's how michael interprets it as oh i can do something as long as i like wink wink don't really want to hurt anybody right yeah So it is permissible for a person to cause a morally grave harm, such as killing, as a side effect of pursuing a good end, but it is not permissible to cause a morally grave harm as a means of pursuing a good end. So, for example, someone's been stalking you. They've been sending threats and you're worried that you're going to be killed. Mm -hmm. You find out who the person is and you kill them before they can try to harm you. That is not morally permissible. That sounds like murder to me. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, well, this guy has been sending threatening notes and he says he's going to kill me. So I'm going to kill him first. (laughs) You know, that's not okay. However, if the person approaches you with an intention of harm, with a gun, a knife, you know, their fist, whatever, then it is okay to defend yourself. Harms that were produced regretfully and only for the sake of producing a good end may be prohibited by the doctrine of double effect because they were brought about as a part of the agent's mean to realizing the good end. 
something like we just mentioned, killing someone so that you can get that good end of being safe, saving yourself, Mm -hmm. is prohibited. Because it was really just you used knew what was to gonna, get the good end. Well, yeah, you knew what was going to happen. Yeah. So this is where I find a bit of gray area because in a lot of the examples that I was reading while doing my research, they bring up euthanasia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that, abortion as well, and right? And abortion, yeah. right. So this is a little bit gray for me because there, the, the, the reasoning here is doctors will prescribe or administer uh, an excessive amount of medication, yeah, painkillers, for example, to stop the pain of this patient. And the side effect is they died. Mm-hmm. The intended consequence is death. Well, the intended consequence is to reduce that person's pain. But they know exactly what's going to happen. They know that they're going to die. Mm-hmm. That's why I feel like that's kind of not really how this doctrine of double effect should work because they know they, they're they starting off with the goal of killing this patient mm-hmm. ending their suffering mm-hmm. they're just finding a way to do it quote unquote legally mm-hmm. it just seems a bit gray yeah there are a lot of criticisms of the doctrine of double effect it's often misinterpreted um it doesn't make it, it okay lead to right to really bad uh it's like really it's suddenly things. it's okay if a doctor's like, oops, I accidentally gave him too many meds. He's dead. Yeah. But it's morally, right? Like but morally he permissible. Said, oops, Is it a- so it's okay. No. <laughs> he he winked. He winked. Yeah. He said oops or he winked or he said, Oh, my bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the that's the Michael school of ethics, you know? <laughs> Where it's okay as long as you kind of apologize for it later. Right. Or uh you wink wink, don't really want it to happen. Okay, let's let's go over this a little bit. The New Catholic Encyclopedia actually provides four conditions for the application of the doctrine of double effect. One, the act itself must be morally good or at least indifferent. So whatever you're intending to do, such as saving your own life or... Administering painkillers. Administering painkillers to reduce someone's pain Mm -hmm. is either morally good or at least indifferent. It's not morally bad. Right. Two, the agent may not positively will the bad effect, but may permit it. If he could attain the good effect without the bad effect, then he should do so. The bad effect is sometimes said to be indirectly voluntary. So you can permit it, but you're not intending to do it. And if there's a way for you to not do the bad effect, then do so. So if there was a way for you to save yourself from someone who's trying to harm you without harming them, then you should do so. Absolutely. For example, calling the police. You know, if you're getting threatening notes from someone instead of going ahead and just killing them before they kill you, you call the police, you report it, the police take care of it, right? And justice will be served. How does this work with euthanasia? I don't think it does. Okay. There is another example which uh, gets brought up a lot, which is... Uh, almost like collateral damage for acts of war. So if there's a military base by a bunch of civilians Mm -hmm. and you can target the military base, great. And if a few civilians die, then that's not your end goal. You don't want that to happen, but it's permissible Mm. as long as you take out your main objective with a strategic missile or something. Right. That has high accuracy. Now, the alternative... Another thing they brought up was you can't, in this situation, use a like a huge nuke to take out that military base, knowing that this nuke is also going to wipe out civilians around it. Mm -hmm. That would be a no-no, but high accuracy missile taking out a few civilians is okay. It's it's the consequentialist point of view. The if there are unintended consequences of civilians getting killed, that's unfortunate, but it is acceptable. Yeah, the idea of maximizing overall happiness in the world. So if I have to take out this military base and some civilians have to die, well, how many will that have saved, right? Mm -hmm. How many people will have been saved? How many people are going to be better off? The world will be better. Uh, The Catholic Encyclopedia also says um, their third condition is 
The good effect must be produced directly by the action, not by the bad effect. Otherwise, the agent would be using a bad means to a good end, which is never allowed. And that's kind of how Michael is viewing things. He wants to kill Derek, a bad effect, right? To get that good effect of not being caught. Mm -hmm. So that's not morally permissible. And the fourth condition is the good effect must be sufficiently desirable to compensate for the allowing of the bad effect. You can't kill somebody because you don't really like them. The good effect is just you're not annoyed anymore, but the bad effect is they're dead. <laughs> Extreme it has example, to be, but it yeah, makes, yeah. It has to be sufficiently desirable, which a good effect of, for example, saving yourself from dying, from being killed by someone, is definitely sufficiently desirable for you mm -hmm. and for most likely the people around you to compensate for allowing a murderer to die. Right. Yeah. So Chidi argues that Michael cannot have the intention of killing Derek. He must only have the intention of saving Jason and Tahani from future harm. So we can't look at it as, oh, well, we've got to kill Derek. It's just, you can tell Jason and Tahani about Jason's relationship with Janet with the intention of saving them from future harm. For example, finding out by accident. And then Tahani maybe being upset, thinking Jason lied to her, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you don't see that as a bit of a loophole? No, it's like I think you it's... have one one action and or one consequence, and you need to get it to happen. So how can you work things in order to get it to happen? No, I don't think so because there's no guarantee that telling Jason and Tahani about Jason's past relationship with Janet will get Janet to get rid of Derek. Right. So there's no guarantee that anything will happen to Derek. He could still stay. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely right. So so I think this is fine, but of course it doesn't really address the problem, right? It's kind of a, well, if I tell Jason and Tahani, then maybe Janet will feel better and maybe Derek will go away. Just like Eleanor said. Right, that's... It's trying to read people and what they're likely to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is what happens, but it happens in a sort of different way. And as well, this possible future harm that they're saving Jason and Tahani from includes the possibility that the other immortal beings will find out about Team Cockroach and send them all to the real bad place. So at this point in the episode, Michael does not at all understand the doctrine of double effect. I mean, he's winking. He's saying, oh, well, it sure would be terrible if, you know, Derek just totally died. <laughs> but as the episode plays out, I think the team discovers... Well, as the episode plays out, the team discovers that there obviously is a way to attain the good effect, saving themselves from being caught, without the bad effects. Breaking up Jason and Tahani, killing Derek. Mm -hmm. Right? Derek does end up getting boxed, I suppose, in this episode. I like that. But he's not killed. It's not a permanent solution to this problem. It's just, okay, Derek is now in a box. He's on power saver mode. I don't really need him anymore because he was really just a tool to make me feel better. He served his purpose. Yeah. I learned my lesson. Mm -hmm. Any more to say or shall we continue? Let's move on. Jason and Tahani recite their vows while Janet officiates. As they're about to say I do, the others dramatically stop the wedding. Eleanor tells Jason and Tahani everything. We flash to Derek and Janet standing near their reset buttons, while Michael, Chidi, and Eleanor decide how to proceed. Eleanor talks to Janet, admitting that she gave her bad advice and letting her know she's there for her. So this is the part where I don't really love Jason and Tahani. Because their vows just feel kind of stilted and awkward. Like, I recall Jason's vows to Janet, of course. And they were they were weird and Jason-like in the same way. You know, send nude pics of your heart to me. That kind of thing. But here he's got sleeves on. I mean, why does he have <laughs> sleeves? Is he just not that comfortable? I don't know. Maybe it's a subliminal thing. Anyway, no. <laughs> so he just seems a little bit more awkward. Like maybe he's not as comfortable. 
And Tahani is still making comments about like, who'd ever thought we'd be here? Me, clearly better than you. You, a swamp dweller. You, a swamp dweller who asked me if the heads on Mount Rushmore have butts on the other side. But, you know, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I guess I love, yeah. I don't know. It just feels a little weird. It feels kind of like maybe at that moment she's realizing this is kind of insane that I'm doing this, but I guess I like you enough. And that's just not that romantic to me. So. Yeah, it doesn't seem very romantic. And it does look like she's not super sure. Yeah. I know that Janet and Jason, during their wedding, they seemed a lot happier. Yeah. And a lot more, I don't know, and just enthusiastic about things. I think so, too. Yeah, there's just a a very different vibe Mm -hmm. from this wedding. So, yeah, yeah, I'm not loving it. We'll see where this goes. Mm -hmm. I like that in this episode and last episode as well, they gave Derek a slightly different sound when he appears and exits. Mm -hmm. Janet's is really quick and upbeat and Derek's is lower and slower, Mm -hmm. which is kind of fun. I like it because Janet's is like a ding and Derek's is like a bong. Yeah. And, of course, Chidi mentions the doctrine of double effect again. So it appears that he still thinks of rebooting as a form of killing, just like he did last season, which makes sense for Janet. But is he looking at Derek as a person? Because he's treating Derek like he's a person this whole episode. Yeah. Because he's saying you can't kill Derek. He's not saying you can't get rid of Derek. You can't power off Derek. You can't kill Derek. Yep, same thing that he was going through with Janet in season one. Yeah. Derek's not a person any more than Janet is. I mean, it's different now. Yeah, I don't know. Because Derek is Janet's thoughts and emotions in like a male form, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe he thinks of Derek as like an extension of Janet and he doesn't want any part of Janet to be harmed. Yeah, I think if I think of it as uh, in that way, like Derek is an extension of Janet's thoughts and emotions and knowledge, then it's a little bit more understandable to me. That he views Derek like that? Yeah. 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 Because, I mean, he's seven hours old. Yeah. Can't kill a baby, Derek. He was just created, which is still like mind boggling to me. And apparently she gave him a wind chime penis. Yeah, what's with that? Yeah, I don't really... She says she says that Jason is better than him because he has a soul. So she's saying that Derek doesn't have a soul, right. which is interesting. And that he has genitals, which, why does that matter to you? If you don't have genitals... I feel like she and thought you don't this have was like an a upgrade sex or something. Drive or something. Why would she do this if unless she thought it was an upgrade? Mm, maybe she was like, genitals mean nothing to me, but I do sure like the sound of wind chimes. Yeah, weird. I, it just felt like a one-off joke that didn't make sense to me. And it doesn't, it just felt forced. Okay. See, I, I like the joke. I like it a little bit later when, when they're kissing it. and it's like, oh, I hear wind chimes. <laughs> and Eleanor tells everyone, don't, don't look, don't look, you know. I'm going to keep looking, but you guys don't look. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good moment. That's fun. But it's interesting. Yeah, she says, like, Jason has a soul. So Derek doesn't have a soul? Right. At least according to her, she does. he doesn't have a soul. Does that mean that Janet doesn't think of herself as having a soul? I don't think Janet thinks she has a soul. But I believe I, the way I view souls is, for Janet, I think hers is growing. I think okay. you can get one. I don't think oh. it's just there or it's not. I think you could get a soul. Okay. You develop one? You could. Over time? Okay. So maybe Derek could have a soul, but he's only seven hours old. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Or because he's an extension of her, they'd be kind of sharing a soul. Yeah, maybe. Hmm, I don't interesting. know. Interesting. Huh. I don't know how the logistics of souls work. Yeah. Guys, send us messages if you have uh, questions or thoughts about Janet's comments. I know in The Simpsons, the idea of a soul is... It's deep inside of you, and when you sneeze, it's trying to get out. That's why saying God bless you crams it back down into your chest. Yeah, I think that's just Catholicism, not the (laughs) Simpsons. Is is that really? (laughs) Yeah. That's how Catholics view souls? Well, like, forever ago. That's why you say bless you. Oh, okay. That's dumb. Yeah. (laughs) I mean... No offense. No, it super is. And I'm not Catholic, so I take 
zero offense. I mean, I grew I up our, Catholic. But yeah. I was talking to our listeners. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry if you're Catholic out there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, not like, just like, sorry about your Catholicism, but yeah. Oh, that's what I meant. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. No. So accepting. All right. So what do you think of Eleanor and Janet's conversation? Eleanor's being a straight up girlfriend. Yeah. Just being super helpful. Yeah. See, this is where I think... Eleanor has learned. Like last season, she was really sweet with Tahani about the whole Jason is not Jian Yu and all of that. She was always really kind with Tahani. And now it seems to just be transferring over to Janet because she's not spending that much time with Tahani. So I don't really think that Eleanor has not learned as much as she did in season one. I just see it coming out in different ways and with different people. Maybe I feel like she hasn't learned as much because we're not spending nearly as much time in the classroom setting as we did in season one. Yeah. We did a lot of Chidi's chalkboard. We did a lot of ethics lessons and we've only had a couple of those in this season. Yeah. Because we're not focusing on that. We're focusing more on how do we pretend that we're being tortured for months and years and whatever. Mm -hmm. And our focus is less on Eleanor and Chidi and more on Michael and Janet and really the whole group. Right. So So she's getting less screen time. And of course, we're not seeing her flashbacks, as we mentioned earlier. So we're not seeing the contrast as often, Mm -hmm. I think. So I think you're right. I think I think that you make some good, good points here. I don't know whether I like that. Okay. I like Eleanor as the main focus because season yeah. one was about her. Right. Her and Chidi, how to hide her from Michael. Right. I just don't know how long they could have gone with that. So oh, absolutely. I understand. I totally, I, it's just, it, it feels like such a big change. It and is. And I can definitely understand huge fans of season one feeling a little bit off in season two mm-hmm. because if that's what they loved about the show... And then it changes so dynamically, changes so drastically, that can really skew how you view as the second season. Yeah, I think so. Definitely. I like it. I love it. It's just so different. It is. It is a very different show than it was in season one. Um, we know the world now, and that changes things in a really big way. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. great. It's like... How Lost Season 1 and Lost Season 2 are so, so huge. Big Mm -hmm. change. Yeah. Massive change. I mean, your characters are still there. In a good place, your characters are still there. You're still getting to know everybody. It's great. It's just the core of the show is different now. Mm -hmm. You've suddenly had this big reveal that changes everything. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I really love both seasons for different reasons. Um, I think at this point, season one is probably still, in my mind, better than season two, but I also haven't seen all of season two. Right. I'm going to withhold judgment until I see the rest of season two. Yeah, that's how I feel too. So getting back to Eleanor and Janet's conversation, I think it's really great, very touching. And I love that Janet doesn't just get over it during the conversation. She doesn't just decide, oh, well... You know, it was forever ago. It was like 800 and some reboots. No big deal. Jason didn't really mean that much to me. I think her line when she says, I don't think I'm ready to talk to Jason. Mm-hmm. I think that's really good. Like, I love that. It's super important. Yeah. Because she's not. Like, she realizes that she's not ready. Mm-hmm. It still hurts. Yeah. And so we know that it was really important to Janet. And I like that. The problem is really just solved by her finally understanding what feelings she's going through right now. Like, this is so foreign to her. She's never been in this kind of situation. She probably doesn't even really understand what it is because that's not something she's built for. Mm -hmm. So her finally getting that, oh, it's okay that I feel this upset. And it's okay that Derek isn't actually making anything better. That it's just going to take time and it's going to take some talking about it and probably some backsliding at certain points, but you never know. Maybe some crying, maybe some ice cream. Yeah, if 
I mean, Janet, we don't know if she can cry. Season one, she could not. Right. But maybe she has developed that ability by now and can let out some of those emotions through crying. I just think it's really great. Like, she's owning her feelings. Some real growth. Some scary growth. Some scary growth. You're still, yep. like, a little worried about I'm her. I'm still a little bit worried about Janet, only because she's so powerful, and now she's more of a person, mm-hmm. and she can create things. Oh, it's... Living beings. Yeah. It, uh... She's becoming uh, quite the adversary. She if really anybody is. needs to stand up to her. You really think she's going to go, like, super rogue or something? I don't know. I, I don't know. I know Janet is just going to get more and more interesting, and I'm kind of excited to see where that goes. Yeah, me too. Anything's on the table. Nothing is off the table. That's true. The table has everything on it. Everything on the possible world, because, I mean, Janet had to go get everything, girl. Yeah. Last episode, so. Shall we continue? I'll go for it. Girl. Janet says goodbye to Derek, reabsorbing his knowledge and putting him into power save mode. Jason and Tahani discuss the day's events, agreeing that they were rushing into marriage. Eleanor shows Chidi the VHS, and they discuss their feelings. Michael interrupts their conversation to have a chat with Eleanor. They shoot the shirt about ethics for a little while, and when Michael returns to his office, Sean is there. Dun dun dun! Uh Uh-oh. And that's our cliffhanger. Zoinks! So again, when Derek says, I understand because you understand, I love that moment. Derek isn't fighting this. He is consenting at this moment, right? Which completely changes this idea of having killed Derek. We're not killing Derek. We're not doing something that he is not okay with. He understands why he's not needed. He's okay with being boxed and everyone will continue to live happily. So, hold on a second. Does this mean that the whole struggle that Janet and Derek were having was just Janet's inner struggle with herself personified in Derek? I think so. And now that Derek is finally okay with being boxed, it's because Janet's finally okay with herself and her feelings. Yeah, that is absolutely how I view this. Okay, I'm just really slow. I'm just getting that now. No, 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 no. No, that's good because... (laughs) You're putting it into words, right? And I don't think I did. So that's how I see it, which is what I really like about this episode too. Like as fun as it is to just see this, there is still something deeper to it. Mm -hmm. It's not just, ah, slapstick, funny humor, like Derek is a ridiculous person. And isn't it hilarious how Janet and him just keep fighting? It's Janet fighting herself. Right. Yeah. Okay, that changes things, that changes the episode for me. Yeah, okay. Do you like it more or less? Oh yeah, I like it much more that way. Because originally I just, I didn't see the point of Derek besides a goofy way to show that Janet has power. Mm. But it's much more than that. Yeah, at least that's how I read it, for sure. Interesting, okay, okay. He's just a personification of her feelings. Mm -hmm. And her feelings are everywhere right? Just like they would be if you're heartbroken, you feel sad, you feel angry, you feel frustrated, you have all of these emotions bouncing back and forth. And they're hard to understand at at points, right? So it makes perfect sense that Derek is exactly that. He's also hard to understand sometimes. Exactly. He's hard to understand. <laughs> Good Bob. I hope we same place again very now. <laughs> I like that, though. Yeah. That's fun. I want to just say that to people during the holiday season. You know, when I see relatives, I want to say that. And if they don't get it, then I can just hand them over my Netflix information and be like, man, watch Good Place season one. Make it happen now. (laughs) And then we get a moment with Jason Dahani that I actually do kind of like. It's just weird. It's like from what, in one conversation, I can go from liking them to thinking they're stupid again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like in the span of two sentences. Yeah. So when Jason says, I'm sorry that it puts you in a weird position. I like that he's comforting her. He's not thinking about, oh, man, that was so cool. I bet Janet was super hot. Like he's not thinking about his relationship with Janet. He's thinking about Tahani and her feelings, her feelings at this moment, which is very sweet. And then... Of course, we get the moment where he's talking about his first kiss with 
the robot from Chuck E. Cheese. And Tawny's like, yeah, that's enough information. I don't want any more. Which is typical to Tawny, right? But it's sweet. You know, they're cuddling. It's nice, I guess. Yeah. So. I mean, I thought they were going to go a completely separate route as soon as he said that. After that, when Tahani says, well, we're, what do we do now? Like, I thought Jason was going to say, why don't we try a weird position? <laughs> oh, my God. I know, right? It just seemed perfect. But I'm glad they didn't. Just reabsorbing. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a cute little callback. It's fun. He's making a joke. I like it. So then we get Eleanor and Chidi's conversation, and let me tell you, my heart broke a little bit. Oh, it just, it hurt. Kristen Bell does such a good job. Those, like, subtle changes in her face, that little tiny smile when she asks him, do you feel that way about me now? It was slightly hopeful. It It was. It was so slightly hopeful. It was. And then when he says, no, I don't think so, and it just fades... And she's like, okay. And then you can see her like putting that mask of like. The defense is raised. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That wall is right back up. And she's like, oh, no, 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 it's fine. Because I don't feel that way about you either. Don't worry, bro. So we're we're okay. Yeah, it's it's really heartbreaking. But I am holding on to the hope that Chidi will feel differently by the end of the season. I mean, there's no way. Like they're playing this as endgame. We know Chidi. It's going to. That knowledge of the VHS tape is going to be it's going to be eating away at him. He's not just going to let that go. Nope. This is going to come up very soon. And especially because Eleanor just cut their conversation off. Yeah. No, we're good. We're done. We had a good talk. And moving on. Chidi's like, no, no, no. We're in the middle of something right now. Like, he's going to want to talk about this again. There's no way he's just going to sweep this under the rug. Yeah, because he just found out about it. He's got to process it. He needs to talk about his feelings. Eleanor has been known. Eleanor has known about this for a while. So she's had time to oh process my gosh. it. What if he like goes to Jason for advice? Like I might have feelings <laughs> for Eleanor and Jason's just like, sweet bro. She's hot. Go it. for it. <laughs> I think I want Jason to give him advice now. Yeah. Yeah. Because Jason's just, you know simple, not at all complicated, not at all overthinking things. Maybe to his detriment at some point. But I mean, he did die from suffocating inside a safe. Yeah, so definitely to his detriment. But in this moment, Chidi could use a little bit of that. Just don't go to Michael. Mm-mm. And I like that Chidi's first instinct is to reassure her. Like he says, I don't feel that way about you but i do feel incredibly close to you like he's trying to reassure her that their relationship is still meaningful to him he still cares about her but he just doesn't see her romantically at this point or he doesn't think he does Mm -hmm. i think chidi does he's just not letting himself that's definitely the shipper in me talking but yeah well honestly he's caught off guard like you immediately are like holy crap wait what if you had those feelings before mm. and then you see this, I don't know, like, what do you do? Do you get, do you get defensive? You're like, oh, I don't feel like that. You don't admit it to yourself or you think it's unfair that all of a sudden this person knows that you were intimate or like, I don't know. I can't even imagine. No, I can't either. It's, it's so out of the ordinary, right? mm mm-hmm. But it seems to me like Eleanor's feelings for Chidi pretty much began when she found out that they had a previous relationship. And then she started to look inside herself and realize that maybe there were feelings there. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if it's going to be the exact same process for Chidi. So then Michael comes in and he has a little chat with Eleanor. He's so confused. And he's just saying, like, I don't get ethics and ethics are really hard. Like, I was having a really hard time today with this doctrine of double effect. And I'm just trying to do something good, like saving us. But I don't know how to do that. And I like Eleanor's little chat about the little voice in her head. Because it's like, wow, she just didn't listen to her conscience at all, ever. <laughs> and now she is. So, of course, you feel better. <laughs> yeah. Um. But to me, I'm a little bit suspicious of Michael in this episode. Really? Yeah. Okay. 
So when Chidi explains the ethics of keeping a secret, he says, oh, good point. And he seems kind of like interested about that. And then he opts out of making the final choice at the wedding. Like he passes the buck to Eleanor. He says, no, 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 I can't do this. You know, Professor Bud's kill got in my head. So someone else is going to have to make the move here. And then he interrupts Eleanor and Chidi's conversation, which is... Of course, an important conversation and could just be like a a beat in the episode, but kind of seemed a little reminiscent of season one when he would be watching them and know exactly when to interrupt or to add an element that would make things a little bit more difficult for them. And then he has this conversation with Eleanor and it just seems like maybe there's something more there. Maybe he's not coming to Eleanor just to shoot the shirt about ethics maybe there's something more there Hmm. i don't know despite everything that we've seen with michael and janet yeah despite everything we've seen i still feel like maybe and then some people have pointed out online um some people have pointed out that Sean is reading Michael's reports he's not reading Vicky's right he's reading the torture reports So I'm wondering, did Michael somehow talk to Sean? What is going on here? I don't know. I'm just, I'm leaving things open, I guess. I'm open to the possibility that Michael has not been entirely truthful. So our roles are reversed because I was originally very suspicious of Michael and you were pretty okay with him. Yeah. And then last, this episode. Yeah, I guess... Just all these little things that I'm noticing. I'm like, is something else going on here? He feels very human, this episode. Yeah, and I think that's part of it, too, is that he seems so human and it almost seems like he's putting on an act. Interesting. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Just just a thought. I'm wondering if anyone shares my suspicion. I just... I only... Don't think that because it would kind of suck if that was like a big twist. Mm-hmm. That Michael is actually evil. Oh, we already knew that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know they're not going to do that. But if that was something that comes up in the next few episodes, like he was really working with Sean to try and take Vicky down and then using Eleanor and she, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I hate to speculate because... I'll leave that in the writer's hands. Like, I know that they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They have a great plan for us, I'm sure, for the second half. I just, I I really want to believe that Michael is starting to be more human and it's causing him to freak out. He just doesn't realize it yet. Like, he had his, his crisis, obviously. And now he's unsure of himself. He doesn't know how to deal with these ethics problems. And he's... A little bit bummed that he's not understanding everything. Okay. And that he realizes that Eleanor is a little bit... Even Eleanor has more experience in some of these situations. Yeah. And he's actually going to her for advice. Yeah. No, This that is definitely a better story. I'm just wondering if they're going to be able to keep themselves away from the surprise twist of yeah. something. Because so, we'll I, I was sure I read early on an interview with Mike Schur saying that there's not going to be like a big season one type twist at the end. Which makes sense because you can't really change the world as we know it. How do you top that? Yeah. Like I know that was in a lot of shows and movies that are based around a early on big reveal or twist. They try to continue on doing that. Mm -hmm. I know it's a silly example, but in the Saw movies, the very first Saw ended with a huge twist. And every movie after that has tried to replicate a similar twist. Every single movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. Really? And sometimes it's successful. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it feels like a big stretch. Uh, even in Lost, the end of the first season is this big cliffhanger, huge reveal. Mm-hmm. And every season they seem to try to one-up it. Right. So... And again, sometimes successful, sometimes not. Exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting whether they're going to try and do that or not. Mm -hmm. So shall we get to our mail? (laughs) 
mail. So our first piece of mail comes from Knit Night Studio at Ariana Perry 1701 on Twitter. She said, I feel like I'm missing something. I don't find this season to be surprising or well written, but everybody else seems satisfied. Season one was amazing, but this one leaves me feeling meh. So, but you guys are so positive. What am I missing? Well, we did talk about this a little bit in the episode. I think it's just hard to get a grip on how different it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Season one had a lot of surprising twists. She doesn't belong here. Jason's actually not a monk. Eleanor revealed herself to be the problem in the neighborhood. Oh, wow, there's a real Eleanor. And then, of course, the huge twist at the end that this is the bad place. So they were constantly surprising us, but I don't think they can keep that pace up in season two. We're getting little surprises here and there, but every episode isn't really ending with a big surprise anymore. Mm. The format of the show has changed, and I think because we've learned so much about this world, by knowing that it's the bad place, knowing that Michael is actually here torturing all of them, that everybody else in the neighborhood are immortal beings torturing them too, we just can't go back to season one. We can't do the same thing. So we have to change the world. And because of that, the show changes dramatically. And depending on what you come to the show for, you're going to like it or you're not. She goes on to say, maybe I'm judging too harshly by comparing it to how I felt about season one. But had I not loved one so much, I would have given up on this season after the third episode. Now, I wonder if you loved season one from the moment it started, or if it took a few episodes in season one to love it. Or whether you watched all of season one, if you binged it all, or whether you watched it week to week. That can Mm -hmm. change things drastically as well. Yeah, I watched season one week to week, and I enjoyed the show, but I was not in love with it until I saw the ending. And then I was able to rewatch and see all the little hints. And it was so fun to go through again. It's very rewarding. Yeah. And binging it was definitely better than watching it week to week. I think this season might benefit from that as well. And of course, whatever comes up in the latter half of the season might change how you feel about season two. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you will stick with it. Um, But I understand if the season is just not hitting the same notes for you. I wouldn't give up entirely. I'd give Mm -hmm. it I'd give it the rest of the season. I would too. Um, And if you're not a huge fan, I'd try season three because it was just renewed. So season three might change things again and you might like where that direction goes. Mm -hmm. So you love the characters. Give them another shot. Yeah. Or maybe you put the show aside for a while, wait till season two finishes, and like V was saying, watch the whole thing straight through. Thanks so much for your comments. Our next piece of mail is from Leslie. And um, thank you so much for writing in and how much you like our podcast. We always love good feedback, obviously. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Uh, I'm not really going to talk about the first section of your email as we discuss the different branches of the good place and bad place in our previous episode. Mm -hmm. Um, But I will discuss the next part. Uh, Do you think the focus of season two is shifting? And like I mentioned earlier in the episode, I think very much that this season is more about Janet and Michael. So absolutely. And after the end of Derek, you write, I'm wondering if this is all some kind of test. What does Michael not know about what's going on? He doesn't seem to be super high up in the hierarchy of the bad place. After all, it is his first neighborhood. So maybe they're setting him up for something. Hmm. What if this is all some kind of test from the good place? Maybe they're experimenting to see if people can be redeemed or something. After all, the whole point system seems massively exclusive. And maybe the higher ups of both places wanted to try something more cost effective. After all, there is no Janet or demons or angels, whatever they are, at Mindy St. Clair's. That's an interesting point. I didn't really think about that because good place and bad place both have their Janets. Mm -hmm. But Mindy's, the medium place does not. Yeah. There's nobody watching over. Mm -hmm. It is very possible that they're thinking about, well, what if we made the medium place its own thing for real with its own neighborhoods and the next part of the email says what if it would be more efficient to have a medium place for most people and they're trying to figure out if people deserve that 
if they can change the afterlife to deserve more than just uh, just the bad place. So maybe give everyone their own medium place. Mm-hmm. If space isn't an issue, which right. I doubt it is, no. what if everybody has their own little place? Interesting. But I was thinking more medium place that resembles the good place and bad place. So a medium place neighborhood. Yeah, a neighborhood, but everything's kind of meh. Nothing's great. There's not. There's no fantastic restaurants. There's just Olive Garden. Your neighbors are okay. Yeah, I think that's interesting. That could be something that they might not have considered. Yeah, a medium place neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I think it would be interesting to have a little, like a little twist like that, where the intentions of the people running the bad place, like especially Sean, are different than what we think they are mm-hmm. at the moment. I like that idea. I think it would be. Something that the show should explore at some point, since we did talk so much about how The Good Place is way too exclusive, and there really should be a place where people like Chidi and Tahani and Jason and Eleanor can go. Although Jason's kind of a... maybe not. But at least the idea of different levels of hell makes sense, because Charles Manson, who just died, should be in the bad place, for sure. But... Does that mean Chidi and Charles Manson are basically the same? Because I'd say no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Leslie, uh, you say, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the season. I am continually surprised and happy about the twists the show has. Thank you very much, Leslie. Yeah, thank you. So we see there's there's different opinions out there. You know, season one was better than season two. People are still... Some people are really loving season two because it's doing something different. Mm-hmm. But I think it really depends on what you're coming to the show for. That's what I love about season two. Mm-hmm. How it's taking the the theme of season one and just flipping it over. Yeah, I think so too. And with characters that I really like too. Mm-hmm. Our next piece of mail comes from Kathleen Hawks. She said, Do you ever think about how Michael and Janet keep talking about all the famous people who are in the bad place, like Columbus, all the philosophers, and Victor Hugo, but we haven't heard a single thing about anybody who is actually in the good place. What does it take to be an actually good person? And who's there? If 300 years have passed, can we assume that Beyonce and Dwayne The Rock Johnson are in the good place? I mean, I want to say yes. Because <laughs> The mean, Rock should be in the good place. If and Beyonce if, is friends with Tahani, then I don't know. I don't know. But she also is 104% perfect. So maybe. Maybe right. she's good to get in there. Yeah, I think that's, again, pointing to how the good place is so incredibly exclusive that it's hard to think of the people that are in the good place. Yeah. There's just so few of them. There would have to be a joke saying like somebody that nobody would think that would be in the good place is there. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't even want to speculate. If Camilla somehow ended up in the good place. Well, obviously Camilla's in the good place. She's probably in the great place. Oh my gosh. She's probably in the best place. Oh God. (laughs) She's probably standing next to God and then people are like, who's that beside Camilla? Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, terrible. Yeah, honestly, I didn't really think about how they never name anybody who's in the good place. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. That's an interesting comment. Thanks for pointing that out to us. Um, yeah, we have so many mentions of who's in the bad place. Mm-hmm. And we did find out that like not even Florence Nightingale was there. Maybe that's because Michael doesn't know who's in the good place. Because oh. he works in the bad place. Right. So he doesn't keep a list of them. And he would just maybe know he wouldn't even be privy to that information. He would probably just know who's not in the bad place. Yeah. And then he can't tell Janet who's in the good place. So that's why she's always saying who's in the bad place. Hmm. I think we just figured it out. Okay. Maybe that's why. So yep. thanks, Kathleen, for your email. Yeah. We just discovered a little bit more about the show. Ooh. All right. So do we have any more we'd like to talk about? Okay. No, no more. He's shaking his head. You can't see him, but he's doing it because he hasn't figured out this medium. (laughs) So in case you missed my mention, um, Good Place was renewed. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. I was getting a little worried. Yeah. You know, some shows like Shameless, for example, was renewed for season nine after the first episode of season eight. Yeah. So I was getting a little bit worried, like, okay, they are going to renew this show, right? Like, it's doing so well. They can't not renew it. Yeah. There was a little bit of worry. There's always a little bit of worry. A little bit, yeah. Especially when you've been let down so many times by NBC (coughs) community. (coughs) Yeah. (coughs) 
<laughs> Sorry, I had something in my community throat. <clears throat> <laughs> it just sounds like you have several people sharing your one throat, which is terrifying. Okay. All right, that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you like the show, please leave a rating and review on iTunes, because this is the best way for others to find the show. And we love seeing your reviews. It's so nice. It just makes my day. Yes. Well, and yours. I it, it makes both of our days. Yes. And when you write us mail and I get a little notification in the middle of the night, I love it. In the middle of the night? Well, time difference. Right. Okay. If it's 3 a.m. for me, it's like 11 or 12 for other people. Long story short, we love getting your emails and hearing re- your reviews. And every time you tweet us and all that jazz, we makes love it. Makes us smile. It does. If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio, and we're on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. You can also email us directly from our website, multiverseradio.ca. The next episode of The Good Place will air Thursday, January 4th, 2018. That sounds like forever from now. Yeah, it really does. But, I mean, December's going to be a busy month with the holidays and everything, and then as soon as the new year begins, there it is. And then we'll be back with an episode... Uh, the following Wednesday. Yep. So we'll see you then, guys. Have a great holiday season. And Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Hanukkah. All of the holidays. Happy Catholics Day. (laughs) Do they have a thing? Yeah, I don't know. Not a lot of people know about it. Bye. Bye. Boop. The races have started. What race? Chicka, 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 chicka. Why are you a train? Podcast races. <laughs> <laughs> Here he is, coming around the inner stretch. It's Fork and Bullshirt, followed closely by Burger of the Week. Fairly? I said fairly. Like a feral cat, but <laughs> <laughs> Um His feral rules. <laughs> <laughs> exactly.